we all learned in about the first grade. Let's sing it together. Sing down this old man. Sunday was just like any other weekend Sunday at work. I work here at Station 18, which is one of the busiest on the department and actually one of the busiest in the country. So, you know, a typical day we can see anything. My evening that night was actually for a Sunday night. It was, it was pretty quiet. Um, we don't typically say the Q word, but it was, it was pretty quiet that night. It was routine day, just running our calls, taking care of the people in our area. We had no idea or knowledge of the concert even occurring. Uh, we went on a, uh, a fire alarm in that general area at around 6 p.m. And when we were driving back to the station, we actually drove past the concert venue. Something that really stood out to me was the, the amount of attendees that stopped to wave, give us a thumbs up, would bring their kids up to give us high fives out of the window. That's when we knew that there was a, a large event going on. Prior to that night, I'd never experienced or heard of the Route 91 concert, so that stood out. But there's always large scale events in Las Vegas and didn't really think anything of it. As you know, this job isn't always the same. Every day is different, but for us, even a different day is the same here. I mean, this is a busy station, we get a lot of calls here, so the day was normal, you know, training in the morning, lunch in the afternoon, and then we kind of do our thing during the day. I laid down in bed around 9.30, and I was sitting reading. Dinner was over, uh, we'd already cleaned up, uh, and we were kind of winding down our day. I was laying in my bunk and, and uh, you know, doing like I normally do, kind of decompressing from the day. I'm John Neal. I'm a firefighter paramedic for the Clark County Fire Department. I've been uh, in the EMS system for probably eight years down here in Vegas. I first started out with the ambulance company. I've been with Clark County for a little over two and a half years. That was the first vacation day I ever took, was Route 91. Um, the shift before, so two days prior, my girlfriend got tickets, free tickets to the, to the last night, so I was able to go. So we were talking, I was, remember specifically talking uh, how to take vacation because I've never taken a vacation day or email chief or anything like that. I've been to the first Route 91 that was here. Um, it's a big country fest, country concert, so uh, the bands come on, they play a little intermission time in between and then the next act comes on. The day of was probably just a ho-hum normal day for me. We had a lot of my friends and family at the at the concert that night. Probably a total of 20 people um, was in my specific group that night. As far as the night going, it was basically a standard you know, nothing crazy night, we we're all hanging out, enjoying the music. Jason Aldean happens to be my favorite country singer, so uh, my girlfriend and I were getting ready to go up front to the stage. We wanted to get close. Jason Aldean started, and I heard the initial rip of gunfire. It sounded like an Iraq war documentary, like the, the shots are popping off in the distance. Another string ripped off and that's when all the lights came on the stage and everybody ducked and ran off the stage. It was coded as a stabbing gunshot. Notes are updated to 20 people shot. An active shooter, 20 people have been shot at the country concert. I was getting out of the rig, and when I opened the door and stepped outside, I could still hear the gunshots. I could actually still hear the guy shooting. 
We had no idea what we were going to be hit with. We probably had 40 to 50 within five minutes. We just started telling those people that can run, hey, just keep going. And that's just where we got a drove of people, just an endless amount of people, it seemed like. And before I knew it, we had probably over 100 patients and one single ambulance. They were coming in truckloads. We just got overwhelmed with people with gunshot wounds. And we just encountered a lot of people, you know, just tons of people running. And we just knew we weren't going to have enough ambulances right away with the amount of people that we had. They just started flooding in five, six, eight vehicles at a time. We were boxed in. Uh, we had one police car with two officers, one of which was injured. Our halls were just a sea of blood. There was so much blood. There was blood everywhere. Vehicles were pulling up to us with patients inside the vehicles and offloading patients to us. Basically, they could just hand us bodies. 80 to 90 percent of our patients were critical. Most of those were headshots, neck, back, chest, and stomach. People had belts and stuff hooked up as tourniquets and you know whatever you can imagine. Just the scope of how many patients and injured and, and dead and how big of an area this was. You see stuff that other people shouldn't see. An idea that the gunfire was coming from Mandalay Bay, that, that direction. So we wanted to, to make sure that we took a route that wasn't going to put us in jeopardy or in harm's way. The route that we took inevitably was where everybody in the venue was exiting to the east. That's when we started encountering uh, a mass of people on foot coming north towards us. As we were driving in, they were just running out of at us like a, a stampede, I, I could call it. The only way I could describe it is kind of like um, The Walking Dead, a blank stare on everybody's face. There was one ambulance we saw near the airport with about, I would guess, 15 bodies next to that one ambulance. There was a woman in the back of the ambulance that she was shot in the lower jaw, fully conscious, and holding her, her lower jaw with a, a towel. So I decided to pull to the side of the road. I turned my lights off. I didn't want to attract any extra attention to our unit and we decided that was the point where we had to get off and get our ballistics gear on. Bulletproof vests, the helmets, and, and was like, that's when I realized this is real. I was getting out of the rig, and when I opened the door and stepped outside, I could still hear the gunshots. Combined with the people and the fear on their faces, the, the noise of the gunshots, us putting our gear on, I mean, we've trained and trained and trained for this, but to actually be doing it was, uh, it was surreal. Pulled all the gear, threw it down to the crew. We started putting it on, and people are coming up to us, asking us where they can go. And my reaction was, head to that Motel 6 and just find cover. I was just trying to get people out of the street where they can find some cover. When we pulled up on the boulevard, there was a, a county vehicle driving backwards towards us, and he came to stop right where we stopped, and he had six patients right then and there for us. And so it wasn't like we had any time to get ourselves rolling. It was, here you go, here's six gunshot uh, victims right away. So we pulled the people off of his truck, began triaging from there, and then from there it wasn't just like, okay, well there's some downtime after these six, it was one after another, after another, after another. It was difficult to, to prioritize the, the critical, the non-criticals, because really everybody that was being brought there and dumped on the ground, they were critical. An ambulance would come up, we'd put two, three, four, maybe more patients in there, and they would get rolling. Other divisions didn't have that luxury. They had a shortage of ambulances. The location where we were at, the five patients, we were inundated with 40 to 50 within five minutes. And they were coming in truckloads. For the first initial, I'd say, 10 minutes, it was uh, organized chaos. I was on the rescue that night. We have transport capabilities. That wasn't what our um, our job was that night to transport. If we would have, if I would have taken that unit out of service and threw that first critical guy in the back of that rig, you know, those guys would have been left behind and they would have been so, I mean, we were outnumbered already to begin with as far as patients go. Somebody pulled up in a pickup truck and said, hey, I've got a truck. Can we put some of these people in the back? And it was like, yes, we can. So normally we wouldn't put anybody in a private vehicle, but that's what happened and somebody saw that truck do it and the next thing you know we had 15 or 20 trucks cars uber drivers lift drivers anybody that was driving out of that venue that was able to get their car and drive we're bringing bodies with them 
50 plus patients with no ambulances to transport them. That's when we made the determination that in order to, for any of these individuals to have a chance, is to keep them in the vehicles and start stopping vehicles and loading injured people into, into pickup trucks. We would stick our head in some vehicles, you know, complete strangers taking other guys, hey, he's been shot, throw a tourniquet or something on him and send them off to the hospital just because whether or not we had an ambulance, you know, we just knew we weren't going to have enough ambulances right away with the amount of people that we had. It was good to see just kind of on the fly people making do with what they have and, and trying to do the best they could. It was truck 18, engine 11, and the one ambulance. And we, I would say, successfully uh, transported 100 people with no transport capability. If, if we were to wait, waited, that number 58 would have been significantly higher. They didn't need to be sitting on the side of a road with a, a firefighter. They needed to be in an emergency room. And there was also a lot of off-duty firemen and nurses and, and people from elsewhere that were helping out. The bystanders, they have no fear of just jumping in and helping out complete strangers. Everybody was more than willing to help, Take their, taking their t-shirts off their back and dressing wounds and, and applying tourniquets. The amount of bystander help, I guess I would call it, it was crucial that night. It was from giving first aid or dragging people over to the triage and treatment centers. We had people being brought to us in wheelbarrows. I encountered this guy in just street clothes and he ended up being like a off-duty Marine. I know he's just in town. And uh, he led us to this patient that he had, some critical patient down in this tunnel of the Tropicana Hotel. And we pulled them out of there and uh, went back to doing what we did on the boulevard, just helping more and more people. And all of a sudden I look up and here's an, that same guy and he's got somebody else for us. You know, he just kept going and finding people and bringing them to us. You, you had walking wounded that a man's holding his filleted open stomach and he's walking up to us saying, take care of my, my wife that's shot in the arm. And then as the night progressed and we, start, so we stopped getting patients, we had to go now and search these hotels and make sure we didn't have any people down there. We'd get reports of some victims inside the casinos. They came up with a plan to make sure each person was taken care of in each hotel. So the way that we did that was to set up rescue task force crews. I was part of one rescue task force. We had five total firefighters and 13 police officers and we all stuffed into an ambulance, going from property to property, finding other victims that were being reported. We did that for several hours through the, through the morning. Other rescue task force were doing the same thing. Uh, I think there was a total of 13 rescue task force. After we were at that North Division um, and all of our patients had been transported, we were tasked with going into the venue, which essentially was to do a body count and make sure that we had accurate numbers. It was surreal, but everybody stayed composed and we were working with Metro at that point. The, the final number that was documented uh, in fatalities was 58. The numbers ranging in uh, injuries due to gunshot wound uh, were over 500. I really give it up to the people who are at the concert. They're the real heroes, to be honest with you, in my mind. You know, you're there having a good time watching a concert and everybody flipped like that. And instead of running and leaving everybody, they, there was people just helping and taking fire and not afraid. And they weren't there to do that. They weren't trained to do that. I mean, yeah, you had a lot of military people there and, you know, but they were there to have a good time. And so those are the true heroes, in my opinion. Um, the people who stayed and helped. My name is Debbie Bowerman and I'm a registered nurse at Sunrise Hospital. I've been a nurse in the emergency room for almost seven years and I've been at Sunrise Hospital uh, just turned 21 years last month. On the particular night of October 1st, my assignment was the EMS window, which is where all the ambulances and firefighters come through with all their patients and it's the kind of the person who's in charge of all the beds in the department for that night. Myself and one of the physicians, Dr. Menez, were sitting up front and we were joking around 
and um, we heard a page overhead, Dr. Menes to Station 1 stat. And nobody pages a physician stat unless there's a situation, a patient's crashing, something like that. And we didn't have any critical patients there that night. So he ran up to the front. All we heard was uh, MCI, multiple shots fired, um, country concert. The, there was an officer who was standing there who was there for the motor vehicle accident from earlier in the night. And Dr. Menes looked at him and he said, hey, is this real? And he said, yeah, this is real. Uh, we had no idea what to expect. All we knew is that there was a lot of people at that concert and we should be expecting a lot of patients. Um, we are not the closest hospital to the venue, but they're not a trauma center. We, Sunrise is a level two trauma center. So at that point, the physicians started making a plan. They started making the phone calls to all the doctors, all the staff, everybody that they could. Uh, the doctors that were there that night, there was four doctors on that night, um, and they devised a plan on which area would contain which patients, red patients here, green patients here. During an MCI, the most senior doctor is who is in charge of the triage area. That night was Dr. Menes. He had alerted for any staff that was available to come down uh, and to bring as many wheelchairs and gurneys as we could find. We all decided, okay, this is what we're going to do. Dr. Menes said we're gonna do a quick assessment and then the patients are gonna be going to their prospective areas. So everybody was just kind of poised by a gurney or a wheelchair waiting for the word. It seemed like forever before the first patient got there. And it was it was kind of eerie because it was it was a dead silence and you would expect to hear just sirens blazing. And I remember it was just so quiet. And then all of a sudden you heard a, a, a faint siren in the background. And the first vehicle to pull up was a police cruiser and he had four or five patients um, in the back of his car. There was two on the floorboard, and then there was three in the seats. And I believe the second vehicle to pull up was a pickup truck, uh, just somebody who had random people in the back of their truck. They had about six in there. And then it was about another five or 10 minutes before another vehicle, and then that was it. They just started flooding in five, six, eight vehicles at a time. We all just took a vehicle and we would run up to the back of the vehicle and it was the same every time. Just throw open the back doors. Where you hit, ask the paramedics if they were stable. Probably about 20 minutes into that, one of the nurses ran out and screamed for Dr. Menes and said that he needed to get inside because there was just too many patients inside for the physicians to handle. And he grabbed me by the shoulders and he said, you've seen what I've been doing, right? And he says, well, okay, I need you to stay out here in triage. And I said, no, I can't do this. I'm not, I, I'm not qualified to do this. He says, yeah, you are, you're a nurse, you can do this. And so he left me out there um, with all these vehicles coming in and all these patients coming in and it was just one after another after another. So I believe the official count was 212, but I, there was many more than that because there were so many patients who were looking around and they realized, I don't need to be here. I, there's nothing wrong with me. I can go, I can go to quick care tomorrow or something like that. There was a man who grabbed me as I walked out and he said, I need your help. And I said, well, sir, I, you know, I, I can get somebody over here to help you. He says, no, no, he goes, I know my girlfriend's dead. He says, I just need you to go find her for me. And then he described her, he described her tattoo. He described her piercings. And, and I had to tell this man that I couldn't help him find his dead girlfriend. But it was just a constant influx of patients. They just, they just didn't seem to stop. It, we ran out of a lot of supplies, um, so we had to have those delivered to us. We ran out of ventilators in the hospital, so we had to have ventilators delivered to us. We ran out of IV solutions. We had one vehicle that pulled up and we opened the doors and it was a young girl and we took her out and I looked at her and she wasn't breathing. She was a, a young girl, about my daughter's age. So 
I jumped on top of the gurney and I was doing CPR and we were going down the hall and we came around the corner and I had screamed for Dr. Menes. He came over and he assessed the patient and he said that I had to stop. And, and I, what do you mean I have to stop? I've only been doing CPR for like three minutes. I'm not supposed to stop. You know, where's the drugs? We have to give her drugs. Where's, we have to push Epi. We have to push all these drugs to revive this girl. She's young. We work on young people for 90 minutes sometimes to get them back. And he told me I had to stop doing CPR. And that, that part is the part that probably sticks with me the most is because I felt that I couldn't do anything to save her. And I'm supposed to do that, that's my job. I was, I was very mad at him because he made me stop trying to save this girl. Hindsight, of course I understand why he did it. The majority of the time I was out in the front there. I hadn't seen what the back looked like. And when I went back there, it was, there was patients everywhere. There was patients giving up their gurneys for other patients who were more hurt. See, I believe we got the first patient approximately 2240. So it was close to midnight when it finally started to subside a little bit. Sunrise received the most patients of all the patients that were transported that night. We got released from the scene about 5.15ish. So we were there from 9.30, 10 o'clock, all the way through the whole evening into the morning. And so, for one, we were exhausted, mentally, physically. I mean, we were wearing these bulletproof vests, helmets. Most of us had bunker gear on. But when you finally, you know, the adrenaline comes down a little bit, you just kind of sit back and you're just going, what in the world just happened? What stood out to me is how many places and how many assignments that just our four-person company re received so everybody had their own story to tell. So we sat at that table and I could just see it on everybody's faces that they were just in awe and shock of what just happened. And we were able to now start processing it. And that's when it really hit everybody. You become accustomed to each other and the different uh, demeanors we carry around the station and everybody had a completely different demeanor around the station that morning. It was just a somber morning. And then the drive home was surreal. And I'd say I was like that for a couple days, just, just numb. I sat in my truck in the parking garage for probably a good 25 minutes and I just, I just sobbed. It hadn't hit me until then of not so much what I went through, but what this person had done. How, how something could happen like this. I just lost it as soon as I drove off property. It was pretty surreal. Looking back and playing that, playing that tape in my head from the last eight hours and what I'd seen and what I, my, my brothers it saw. And that was our last shift of our, of our cycle, to be off of work for six days. Th that first day, everybody wanted to be with their family and kind of take in what occurred, nobody had slept. I thought it was important to reach out to, to our crew and say we need to all meet up, family, wives, spouses, significant others, um, to go just have a, a beer and decompress. And that's what we did. We got to talk. We got to kind of deal with what we were going through. Being together with the guys afterwards was pretty awesome. I didn't expect that everybody was gonna show up, but there was 100% turnout. Everybody showed up. The thing that really stuck in my mind the most is um, our battalion chief. He did an outstanding job that night. Um, and it's a guy that I've sat next to at that dinner table for the last eight years. And you know, he's molded me as a firefighter. And so that night, hearing his voice and the way he, he ran the call, I never looked at a, another man. So like he was just such a strong presence in my life. You know, he, he was somebody that you could look to, but. So that morning I went to go say, hey chief, you did a great job. And I walked into his bunk and the man was sobbing uncontrollably on his bed by himself. And so I just remember seeing him and just, I knew it was more than just what we just done. It was gonna be with us for a long time. It was, uh, it was tough. That was one of those where it's like, man, we're not invincible. Long-term, 
I think everybody started seeing a lot of the effects about three to four months. But the aftermath, you know, is, I guess it still goes. I can still see up to and including the outfit of the girl that I was doing CPR on. I can see her face, I can see her hair, I can see her clothing. You know, and I'm, I'm still dealing with it as far as um, counseling and just getting it off my chest sometimes, and that's, you know, sometimes we just need to do that. That first shift back, we made a point to go down to Sunrise Hospital just to see these people. You know, you help them what you, you can, but some of them we didn't even get names on. It was, you know, tie a tourniquet or put some bandage on, do an assessment real quick, and then off they go. And so we wanted to go and see these people after and see how everybody was doing and if people were recovering. And it was, it was sad to see the, the amount of people's lives that were changed. One of the guys that was on our crew, he's from California. And so we're in the hallway of the hospital and as we're walking down just seeing people, one of the people had a, a, a sweatshirt from his high school. He's like, that's the high school I went to. It's a Southern California high school. And he went up to the lady and said the high school motto. And she's looking at him like, how do you know that? And he's like, that's my high school. And she's like, well, my daughter was shot. She's in that room. She's a teacher there. And she says, well, you got to come meet, come meet my daughter. So we've kind of developed a relationship. She's came in and visited us a couple of times and just following her story, you know, how, how she's recovered, you know, she's a, just a trooper. And along with the rest of the crew, and we've kind of all formed a bond with her and her family. I'm not surprised by any way about how, you know, my coworkers responded that night. Uh, you know, I see them every day do something remarkable. I mean, these guys are so eager to help people. Um, you know, they're so well trained. You know, they come to work every day to make a difference. Just the fact that everybody worked seamlessly together. I and mean, it wasn't just us. It wasn't just the county fire department. We had MediQuest, AMR, community ambulance, all the all the police entities in town were there. Everybody was just kind of a, a one group and not, hey, you're them, you're us, you guys stay over there. I mean, everybody worked flawlessly together. The number that sticks out to me is 58 people died. And it seems like whenever a shooting like this happens, you know, you, you read the news and, and you say, ah, you know, 11 people were shot. And then you, unfortunately you go to bed, you wake up the next day and two more of the patients died. It just shows you that the program works. Unfortunately, 58 people died, but it, it's remarkable to me that that's, that's it. You know, you didn't wake up the next day and see the horrible news that more people passed away. You know, that was it. I see the best of humanity in this community <clears throat> and I see the worst of it. But that night I saw both. In one night, you can see that wide spectrum of good and bad. Uh, through all the tragedy and, and the heartbreak and, and people losing family members, it was the closeness that it brought this city. The way that that the community pulled together was amazing. Just, just the generosity in the general public. The next day, the lines were down the street to give blood and to donate food and water and whatever anybody needed. The whole city was like, what do you need? The line to donate at the blood bank was seven hours long, and people stood there the whole time waiting to donate blood. It was one of those events that will change my life. Um, you know, I look at life differently. I look at this job differently now. And I'm just, just proud of the department. Um, proud of my brothers and sisters I worked with that night. We saved hundreds of lives that night. That's, you know, that, I think that was the proudest moment that I have on, on this department probably the, the, the proudest moment in my life. Um, we saved a lot of people, I think.